Conchetta, thank you very much for your time. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm very, very well. I tell you what, you didn't miss. We'll get to those statements in just a short while. Let's look at China's reluctance to hold an inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. Have they got additional things to hide, do you think, or is this purely a cultural way of trying not to say, not to lose face in the, in the eyes of the world? Look, Chris, uh, China has a long history uh, with pandemics. I mean, let's go back in history, going back to the plague of Justinian in uh, 541, I think. And so when you start looking at the Black Plague and you look at all sorts of pandemics, it's been the source of many of those uh, in history. Look, we are dealing with a totalitarian regime and totalitarian regimes by their very nature are secretive. They don't abide by the same set of rules that democratic countries like Australia do. Uh, and what we have seen is very typical of what has happened in the past. I mean, we saw that after the SARS outbreak, the World Health Organization revised its uh, regulations, but of course, uh, the communist regime didn't learn the lessons from the SARS uh, outbreak, and we're seeing history repeating itself. Now, Chris, whether it came out of the wet markets or whether it came out of a laboratory, the reality is the virus uh, originated in China, and therefore there is a legitimate uh, reason to hold China culpable for what has happened as a consequence of the Wuhan coronavirus. Does that mean that you think that they should be paying reparations as well? Look, I think that, Chris, there are two things that Australians are now uh, expecting post-virus and post-pandemic. One is uh, that our government has the political and necessary political fortitude to do those things which are in our control to do. And they are a plan to consider reparations and a plan to decouple from China because we cannot go back to business as usual after uh, this pandemic. And Australians are expecting us to change our dealings with the communist regime in China. The United Nations claim to be all about the safety and security of mass populations, especially those who are less fortunate than Western countries. With that in mind, how can China remain in the United Nations on the basis that they don't think it's informative, at the very, very least, to have a, an inquiry into how we got a pandemic in the hope of not having another pandemic? Look... Chris, I think that it's commendable to push uh, for um, an inquiry, but the reality is that given uh, China's veto uh, and the veto framework within the, uh, within the United Nations, and we do know that the United Nations uh, is an entity that has had problems with uh, lack of efficiency, with all sorts of problems have beset the United Nations. And so I do not believe that the communist regime will ever cooperate with any inquiry. And so hence my point, Chris, that it's important for us and for the Australian public to pursue those things that are important and those things that are within our own control. And that is a plan to look at reparations and a plan to decouple from China. And we know that there's been some very, very good work that's been done by the Henry Jackson Society, a leading UK think tank, which has actually prepared a very good paper uh, entitled Coronavirus Compensation. And that details uh, in uh, quite explicitly avenues that are open to countries and to the world to pursue the communist regime in relation to this pandemic. Indeed, they're talking about suing China for $6.5 trillion. That's one component. The other component, and probably the most important, is that uh, we look at some plan to decouple from China. We cannot have a quarter of our two-way trade eggs in one basket. No. We cannot have 33% of our exports going uh, to one country, albeit that they are exports which are vital to China's economic growth, such as iron ore, coal and gas, and, of course, 
food to help it feed its 1.3 billion people. Yes, exactly. They need us as well, although they're not showing it at the moment. I, I want to ask you about the words that were written on Twitter as a result of Julie Bishop talking about quiet diplomacy in reference to China's lashing out at Australia and the beef and, and barley uh, ban they've gone on us at the moment. And your reaction was another airhead comment from the couch. We had six years of Instagram diplomacy that ignored Chinese Communist Party, skullduggery and debt trap diplomacy. Uh, Julie Bishop was not your favoured foreign minister, Conchetta. Well, Chris, uh, can I say that those comments are made in the context that when I was Minister for International Development, I travelled extensively around the world and most especially in the Pacific. I did about 35 trips to the Pacific. I gave warnings about what China was doing uh, in most especially in the Pacific, its activities, particularly in relation to debt trap diplomacy. Yeah. I saw firsthand what was happening out there. And regrettably... In, uh, before I you leave that, in other words, for those who don't know, prop up the minnow nations, give them as much money as they want and then have them in your debt for the rest of their history. Well, basically, it's uh, infrastructure-based. And so what yeah. happens is that uh, you lend money for a, an inf a a piece of infrastructure, uh, they can't sustain payment of that debt. And then, of course, normally this has been a debt for equity situation. Yep. And so what happens when they can't pay the debt? The, the asset reverts to usually the communist uh, party entity uh, that has lent the money or the bank or the Chinese bank that's lent the money. And so we saw this. I mean, let's not forget... That and so what, Julie Bishop didn't act on when, what you've seen? Well, what I'm saying, Chris, is that at the time it was very clear what was happening, not just in the Pacific, but in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And so I pushed very strongly for the Pacific to be one of our five priorities. I pushed very strongly for us to have a much more Pacific focused overseas development assistance. Mm -hmm. But regrettably, Chris, what we have seen, I believe, has been a foreign policy, a fellow traveller foreign policy uh, adopted by those uh, who have and those who have been having dealings with the communist regime in China, basically turning a blind eye to what China was doing to China's skullduggery. And we know what that is. And Julie uh, Bishop was the, one of the great offenders, was she? The, well, I'm just saying, Chris, that... that well, she uh, was the foreign minister. She was the foreign minister, and I believe that more could have been done at that time okay. in relation to what was happening with China. And let's not forget that those were very critical years where a lot of this was happening. And so that's really the point that I'm making. Of course, my comments in January 2018 have been totally vindicated yeah. as we see what China has been doing around the world. All right. I like your fire. I like your passion in particular. Thank you very much for your time this evening and explaining all of that.